Well, thanks for joining us today. So um, as we cover the industry at Sports Video Group, I, I think regardless of if you're on the regional level or the national level, um, you know, budgets are as tight as ever, and you're being asked to do more with less on a more regular basis than probably ever before. So let's start out, um, and, and Phil, and then Mike, I'll, I'll let you guys kind of begin. Um, in terms of keeping that A-level look without uh, having to have the same uh, crazy amount of resources, how are you accomplishing that? And, and are you trying to accomplish that, or are you just saying, hey, this is our product, we're throwing everything that we have at it? Um, Phil, in terms of efficiency, what, what are you guys working on? So I think one of the big things that's been helpful to us is the advancements in technology. Um, equipment that used to cost six hundred, seven hundred thousand dollars $700,000, you are now seeing ways to do that for one-third that price. Um, so as you look to try and add things to your broadcast, whether that's you know, an additional camera or that's a robo or it's um, a jib or whatever it is, the cost for those types of things has gone down considerably over the last few years, and that's been really helpful to our business. I think the other thing you do is you look hard and you say, you know, what do we need to do to create excellent programming? Uh, and depending on what that is, whether it's spring training or it's regular season or it's playoffs, you may up the amount of investment you make on each of those broadcasts. But you want everyone to come off looking excellent, and you want the fan to be engaged. So. It's an ever-ending battle. Sure. Uh, Mike, I I'd like you to talk a little bit about a term I think we're going to hear. You're probably going to hate it by the end of the day, let's be honest, and that's at-home production. Um, at SVG, we, we write about it all the time, but the idea of locating some of your resources back home rather than on-site uh, while keeping the illusion, for lack of a better term, that, that everybody's still there. Um, how are you guys at Fox looking to deploy some of those workflows, and, and how have you seen them pay off or, or not pay off for that matter? Um, obviously a, a big topic of conversation. Um, you know, kind of to follow up what he was saying and then to follow up what Jeff Krolik was saying, you know, you have to prioritize your events. And, you know, we really focus on our pro product as our premier event, so we really try not to touch it. We build it up, we make it look good because, you know, as we say internally, every event needs to look like a Fox event. And um, so we really leave that alone. There's been a lot of discussion internally about, you know, how could we make that an at-home production. But, you know, we still have to deal with our relationship with our teams, our competitors, and competitors not necessarily like a Comcast or a Time Warner, but competitors like ESPN who has non-exclusive uh, rights to our games. Um, so we have to look good and feel good. So for at home, yeah, it, technology is allowing us to, to find new ways to produce these games. And then there's Joseph Marr. <laughs> um, but um, the, um, uh, we kind of pick and choose. You know, if we have that event, it's an ACC event, and it's in Syracuse, we don't want to fly a whole crew up to Syracuse, even though, you know, there's probably a lot of good students that could do it. So we find a way to fly those cameras back. So we, we, we choose the events where we know we can save some dollars. We did, we're not looking to do every event that way. In time, technology will probably allow us to do it. But I think right now we're a little early, and I think it's something we have to, uh, we have to tiptoe, not run into. Uh, because, you know, you start flying cameras out of a Dallas Mavericks game, I think you're going to get a call from Mark Cuban, don't you? <laughs> David Henry, maybe? Or John Henry? Yeah, he'll want to know what to invest in, though. Right, I think. exactly. <laughs> right. Joseph, how are you guys getting creative in terms of deploying resources efficiently while kind of keeping that A-game uh, look on the screen? Yeah, you know, similar to what Mike said, we're really not looking at regular season pro product. Um, it's no big secret that eventually this is an industry that's looking at 4K and other technologies um, on what they're trying to do with their A-level. Uh, what we decided to do about a year ago was start to look at what we're spending on all of the different technologies that people in this room provide or resources we share with some of the other regions. And so uh, challenged our executives to take existing assets that we currently use, line item by line item in our budgets, whether it be for the games pre and post, ancillary programming, and find a way to monetize every possible line item in a budget. And um, that doesn't mean we're gonna look like a NASCAR race car, but NASCAR's figured out a way to do it. Um, but we have found some creative things that we're now bundling together where we work with our sales department and come up with groups of things that by themselves, you might not be able to sell that technology or that item alone, 
but if you group six or eight of them together um, and put them into a theme, then it's something that sales can go out and sell. So one of the things we've been able to do to stay competitive and continue to grow is to look at how to make money off of the resources we've got and just package them up a little bit differently um, through a budget analysis. Sure. Ken, you guys, um, uh, I, 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 this might be blindsiding you because uh, I don't think we talked about it before, but you guys do a pretty cool um, setup with lacrosse when we're talking about being efficient and, uh, and doing the production. I believe the video pr production is the telecast for Altitude, right? Uh, the video production is, yeah, it's the in-house, taking the in-house. Right, right. And why does that kind of make sense for you guys in terms of being efficient, again, using the least amount of resources and still hopefully the product, the, the viewer at home maybe can't tell the difference? Well, one thing, if you, um, we've taken feeds also from across the country of lacrosse and, um, you know, we're really weighing whether we want to do that because it's, it's so bad. Um, you know, working with our uh, in-game folks and and doing the main show and 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 again I'm I'm walking I'm five months uh, from root sports uh, and coming over so I've got at the tail end of that season and seen the both the efficiencies of doing it the way it is um, so at uh, the Pepsi Center there is con two control rooms so um, you're basically in a dual feed situation in the control in the in-house control room which they, uh, you know, there's, which I'm looking into doing more and more with that and in, and in arena of, to be more efficient, but in the lacrosse side of it, you know, the in-game was uh, doing the main broadcast and we're, take, we're basically taking a dual feed. So it, it, if, if you look at lacrosse coverage across the country, it, it really works and it really allows us to do a sport that isn't a revenue generator and, um, and, and be able to do it and do it well. Right, that's kind of the model, right? You pick and choose your spots, kind of like Mike yes. was saying, yeah. Mark, uh, you guys are doing some pretty cool stuff uh, with WNBA, uh, with MLS, and some other things in terms of efficient workflows. Do you want to kind of give an overview of those? Well, I appreciate that. I think the panel articulated it well. I think you focus on that, which is primary for the business and, and sort of invest there. But I think every element and every link in this chain has evolved technologically and philosophically. This is something we look at all the time. I think primarily connectivity, uh, at-home productions. Uh, we never would have thought this plan, being from the Paleolithic uh, era, era, as Jeff <laughs> pointed out, you know, we never would have looked at something like cellular or Wi-Fi distribution. We never would have looked at some of the things that we do now as fundamental. So specific to those uh, sports that are not, as you put it, out, put it Kenny, uh, uh, revenue generating. You know, we look at things like at-home productions. We look at, at different uh, production uh, elements at different trucks and, and in-home in home productions. But I think it also gives way to, to elevating MLS and elevating WNBA right. and elevating lacrosse and things like that that wouldn't under the, the normal production circumstances ever have a shot. So I think that's, it's incumbent upon us to keep doing that. Sure. Um, next, we have some kind of uh, widely varying philosophies when it, when it comes to non-live uh, premier game programming. Jeff mentioned that they are, Fox is all about putting uh, your resources into those primary products. You invested in those rights, so let's make it look I I as great as humanly possible. And, and original and, and shoulder programming, it, it, while important, you know, that's the main event. Um, where does everybody stand on that? Phil, we'll go down the line again and start with you. Um, it, how important is original programming and studio programming to CSN Chicago? Um, is it uh, at the forefront? Do you do you make it a key element when you're laying out, you know, budgets, philosophies, that kind of thing, or is it a little bit in the background? So, it, it, there's no question that games are what are the priority for the channel and the pre and post surrounding those games. But we also believe that there's a fit for other products, and the big one for us is sports news. Um, ESPN does a fantastic job with news, but if you're a Cubs or a White Sox fan, you can sometimes wait 40 minutes before you get to your Cubs and your White Sox highlights. So we think there is a fit and a need for that local home team sports news broadcast where we're giving you everything, Cubs, Sox, Bulls, Blackhawks, Bears, and we're super serving that to you. We have a sports talk um, initiative. Sports Talk Live is a show that we do at 5.30 every day with David Kaplan, and that's really become a revenue-generating um, vehicle for us. And it's not a lot of cost. As Mark said, you can find ways now to do things um, outside of the games at a much more cost-effective margin, and you can really drive revenue with that. The other big piece we've really um, sort of bitten into is high school programming. 
we've really found that in particular uh, downstate Illinois, the state of Iowa, places like that, people are as tribal about their high school state championships as they are about the Cubs and the White Sox. So we've really taken an investment and looked at ways to bring those games to the consumer on our air. Mike, can you expound a little bit on what Jeff kind of uh, touched on in terms of really putting those primary events front and center and, and then your philosophy beyond that with shoulder programming? Yeah, so, I mean, we spend a lot of money on these rights fees with these teams, and that's where our investment is. You know, and, and the rights fees today are, you know, comparable to what the networks were paying 20 years ago, 25 years ago. So, you know, we focus on that. That's our priority. And we want those games to look like network level games. And, you know, obvious, you know, with the, the launch of FS1, they've been taking our games and just putting them on the network because they are, you know, we're built into our stadiums, we're close to our teams, we have relationships. So we really build on that. As far as, you know, supporting that, it, you know, you have 11 different executive producers across the network and 11 different GMs and they all have philosophies. And I, I once went into uh, Jeff's office and I said, you know, you got this beautiful 55-inch Sony TV, but I've never seen it turned on. And he looked at me and goes, do you really want me to turn that on? <laughs> and I kind of thought about that, and that's a good question because the GMs, they, you know, you're always fighting ideas, and everybody has ideas. EPs have ideas. And so we try to streamline the philosophy as if it's not supporting our live event, why would you produce it? And so if it's this great feature on a guy who, you know, the great high school coach that has 10, 12, you know, championships and we do a half hour show on it, how does that help your network? How is that going to help the Diamondbacks or how is that going to help, uh, you know, the Clippers? You know, we want all of our programming to support our live event. Everything should feed and build, uh, you know, interest in what we spend all of our money on. So if you see a half hour show, it should be on that team or you know, we did a thing on Joe Garagiola for obvious reasons, but he was a big part of the Diamondbacks in Arizona. And so, you know, the great GM or a great, you know, the manager, we want people to know our teams, and so we sell our teams. And that's kind of the philosophy we take. You know, news can be uh, turned into many different things. We focus a lot on our pre- and post-game show, which is the same philosophy as we don't get enough of our teams. We want to hear from all of our players. We want to hear what the manager says. What happened? What were you thinking? Um, so we build on that. Some of our regions do an hour, some of them do a half hour. It depends on, the, on the, you know, the, the, the strength of the team and the strength of the market. So we really try to focus on our main, main product. Joseph, uh, you guys have all kinds of original programming across Nesson, uh, even a kid's show for that matter. Uh, do you want to touch a little about how important that is to you guys, where your philosophy is, and maybe where you differ from Mike a little bit? Yeah, and you know, it was a big change moving from the Fox Sports world to the to the Nesson world. And part of that is because Nesson is independently owned. Um, and so it's easier to try different things, pilot ideas, um, and figure out what you want to try to do. Um, but a lot of that, Mike and I have actually talked about this, a lot of that ancillary programming does support the team. So we do a weekly 30-minute uh, kids pregame show that is essentially a pre-pregame, um, all about the Red Sox, commercial free. Um, but we still monetize it uh, with the idea that if we're going to get people interested in baseball, the 7 to 14 year old group, in four years that 14 year old is 18 and they're in the 18 to 34 demo. So um, we probably uh, extend ourselves out about as much as you can. Uh, most days we do at least one if not two pre-games. Um, we always do two post-games. Then we have a newscast before that, so that's kind of a pre-pre-pre and then a newscast after that's a post, post, post. So um, we do a total of eight hours of, of uh, daily news, uh, three original programs that, that then either run on a wheel or get updated as news changes. Um, but to Mike's point, if it doesn't make sense for the business, why are you doing it? So you know, one of, the, one of the things that's tough in Boston is that we have five over-the-air stations because there's a, a station in Manchester, and then three um, regional cable networks, um, the, the Comcast uh, regional, which does news, there is an all news regional channel, and then there's Nesson. So, even without ESPN, that's only two hours down the road, uh, or somebody coming from New York, there there are eight broadcasters all covering what's going on with the teams. And and part of why we're trying to create original programming is to stand out, differentiate yourself, and be the first destination when you turn on the TV in the morning. Hopefully, you had the game on last night. It's on the same channel, right? Our technology hasn't changed. 
you're still turning the TV on in the morning and it's on the channel from the night before. So if we can get you to watch the game, keep you on news, we know the first thing you're gonna see is some original programming we're doing. The change maybe that we've done in the past six months is to look at, again, back to what I mentioned earlier, how do we monetize that and set up pretty rigorous hurdle rates for profitability. And you know, I'm very proud to say that we're really not launching anything and as we're looking to develop new programs, we're not doing any of it without the idea that it has to be profitable by, by a certain um, hurdle rate so that we know that it makes sense for the business financially and as much as possible we try to augment that programming for the, team, the teams like the kids show. We have a, a, a dining lifestyle fitness show but it's profitable. So you know what Jeff mentioned earlier is, is spot on. If you can make something profitable and drive interest um, and we're finding that it takes about two years to catch an audience. The first year, people are, what are they doing with a lifestyle dining <laughs> show, right? right. But, um, but after the second year, it becomes um, more part of the fabric of the community. And so, you know, our, our leading chin would be, is it profitable? And does it make sense for our owners, which are the teams? Um, and hopefully it's both. Ken, it's nice for you guys. You almost don't have to worry about, I feel like, original programming when it's hockey and basketball season because you have so much going on at altitude with the Avs and the Nuggets. But, um, of course, it's, I'm sure it's integral to you guys' philosophy, especially during those long uh, summer months. Um, so where are you guys at in terms of shoulder programming and original programming outside the, the primary uh, game telecast? Well, coming from um, the Fox world with, at the time, it was 22 regions, and then you know we sold off three of them. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> um, but anyway, went over to the, uh, the Liberty Media DirecTV world and uh, worked for Mark. Um, but it was, uh, you know, with the, that many regions, it was always looked upon that if you're doing it for one region, you need to do it down the line. It, that makes sense, and it was all about the live. So now in this situation over at uh, Altitude, team-owned network, you really can try anything. Um, you know, you can, you can go two weeks with the show, and if it doesn't work, then, you know, let, we're on to something else because we own the networks, own the teams. So I'm really looking at networks like Joseph and uh, Mark's over at Time Warner, and, you know, a, our teams have an identity problem. Nobody knows who the players are, um, and the teams aren't really good right now. Uh, so you look at a show like Mark's at, with uh, Backstage Lakers, terrific show hard knocks type show it's ter it's terrific and you know one of the producers that one, uh, one of my producers over at uh, root sports said i hated kobe bryant but watching that show now i love him <laughs> and it's true you watch that show it was it, it, it's destination um you know it's destination viewing and uh when you look at what you can produce and how you can support the team and being embedded with the team you know, my pitch to the GMs, the coaches, um, has always been we want the kids out there to fall in love with your players. We want them to beg their dad to take them to uh, the game and buy tickets. We want them to stay with our broadcast because their player might be doing something. We want them to buy the jerseys. So it, we're all in it together with the teams. You know, we all help each other. We're going to hopefully drive ticket sales, jersey sales. Um, but, but that's, you know, to support what you guys said, just to support the teams and being embedded with the teams and producing um, that content. And we're even, I'm even looking at, you know, it, all, all of our networks have a ton of unsold inventory, right. you know, during the days. So why do I have to produce a 30-minute show? Um, you look at what uh, the team sites are doing, you know, we're, we're uh, broadcasting uh, uh, the Rams uh, preseason games, or we're the production arm uh, to do that. And you looked, and, I, and going out there with, you know, eight people dedicated on the Rams broadcasting network to, to producing these hard knocks, mic'd up, uh, helmet cams, all these little short little um, features, you know, well, why can't we with our teams produce minute 30, two minute, and those things run in unsold inventory. So it's not programming a 30 minute show. We're programming how a lot of kids watch it, whether it's you know YouTube clips or, or whatever. So you know we're, we're not just looking at long form programs, we're looking at short form. Right, right. And I do want to talk digital strategy, we'll get to that next, but Mark, can you talk a little bit about backstage and some of the, I mean, in terms of behind the scenes access, 
you guys have really done you know quite a job over the last couple of years in making us apparently like Kobe Bryant, which I think was very tough for a lot of people. So how did you do that? Well, I appreciate that. I think you know I'm listening to the. Uh, this is the fun part, right? Where the question in, in, initially was, what's the difference in philosophy of RSNs? And again, having worked for kind of most of them and most of you. Um, everybody's got a different point of view, but what is a common denominator in the conversation is everything's about creating something new. Even to Jeff's point and, and to Mike's point, it's about sort of re utilizing resources the right way. You guys actually didn't speak of this, but your, your digital effort, for example, is enormous in your new investment. So it's not that you're not doing something or you're not doing ancillary programming, you're creating content for a different means. So uh, our point of view, so, so you know, when you think about it broadly, and Comcast is trying to win in news, and Root Sports is trying to win in sort of its team orientation and what uh, some of the individual networks are doing is very focused as, as just articulated. We're kind of in that space. We came to start the, the Lakers and the um, Dodgers networks uh, to really be, to provide depth and access around those teams for their fans. So that's our editorial sort of mantra. And so that's why, to answer your question, backstage becomes relevant and meaningful to us. Now, it's no different from Mike's point of view about pointing back to the games, ultimately. Right? We are business people, and ultimately, we need to actually drive the revenues for our owners and our shareholders. Uh, but our point of view in that is we do think stuff that maybe others don't think is relevant does drive viewership and interest back to those games and ultimately those teams. The Lakers fans are fans nonetheless. They've won 21, 17, 27, 21, and 17 games in their last three seasons. Um, so, uh, and yet their season ticket uh, renewals are 97% this year. So, uh, and our ratings at, for the Lakers are still significantly higher than any other teams in the LA market. Uh, so, with the exception of the Dodgers, which is our other partner. So, um, so the interest and the fan interest is there nonetheless, and it stays and it's sustainable, and fans are fans, right? Fans don't leave their team. Fans are frustrated when their teams don't do well. So, so we think backstage and personality creation, which one of you articulated, is actually one of the reasons and ways to keep people intrigued and interested and elevated uh, when maybe the team performance is in the natural ebbs and flows that we see. So it, it was hinted at uh, throughout that uh, little topic there, but let's talk digital strategy. Um, I think just a few years ago, uh, most fans would have not thought, I'm going to go to my RSN's website for my local news. Um, I think that's changing in a lot of markets um, in terms of the fact that you guys already have access to these guys. You already have content in certain cases, depending on the rights. Um, how are you trying to drive your websites uh, socially and, and, and try to expand beyond just the linear telecast and the linear channel to try to hopefully build that audience and, and maybe add content that simply wasn't there before and make your guys' website and digital properties the go-to uh, for fans when they're looking for that local news. Um, Phil, go ahead. So digital really was the backwards approach from the linear channel. Everybody up here has talked about the linear channel, you get the games and you build around the games, and so the games are the priority, and all of this ancillary programming comes as you continue to evolve your efforts around the games. On the digital side, we had no game television streaming rights. So we started with the ancillary and we've built all this ancillary programming and now hopefully knock on wood we're we're moving towards live streaming of all the professional sports. We currently have deals with the NBA. Um, we're, we're chasing Fox a little bit with the Major League Baseball and hopefully knock on wood hockey soon. But I think those um, those streaming rights are going to allow us to go where the consumer is and as Jeff said bring our content to them on a device and a platform that they want to consume it on. Last year we did some things where we would stream the Bulls game. So you could watch the Bulls game on your 65 inch flat screen HD TV or you could go on the computer screen and you could watch the game but there was a second camera feed and it was an ISO camera that just followed Derrick Rose for the entire first quarter. And in the second quarter it just followed Jimmy Butler for the entire second quarter. So you look because at Derrick Rose got hurt in the first quarter? Or? <laughs> Wow. <laughs> um, but those are ways that you can be different, unique, and provide alternative options to people through the live stream um, that we haven't necessarily done on the linear channel on a regular basis. So I think it's as we get those streaming rights, you're going to see even more um, unique and interesting ways that we can deliver content to the fan. Mike, he mentioned your baseball, uh, the streaming uh, deal that you guys ha have put together and everything. How does that impact all this? And even beyond the, the streaming aspect, which is obviously the sexiest thing, 
Uh, how do you also create content for the website and social kind of ancillary content? Well, it's a, a couple of places for us because we have the Fox Sports Go app, which is really for streaming more than uh, more than the content that the regions are creating. Uh, it's a combination of Fox Sports, Fox Sports One, and the regions. Well, it's nice to have all that content that you can uh, see in one spot. And so uh, the the baseball deal is still in its infancy, but it's growing every day. And as as the ratings are on the linear channels, you know you can expect the Royals have a lot more streams and a lot more length of streams than, say, the Twins. Although the Twins are pretty passionate fans, but uh, not really good product to watch this year. And so, and then as far as the content, you know, everything's anchored by FoxSports.com, with the regional websites kind of splitting off, and then all the content coming from the regions is pushed up through the local websites and. Uh, FoxSports.com. So not much unlike what they're doing. We're made a little bit ahead with baseball, and we've had a year under our belt with NBA, and it's growing and growing and growing and growing, and we're pushing it hard. But again, you know, everything goes back to the linear channel, and uh, without the success of that, the digital will not. It'll just kind of come along. It's like kind of something you have to have. If you don't have it nowadays, you're kind of left out. So. How much does the in market, do the in-market streaming deals uh, drive, and hopefully with other leagues maybe adopting, how much does that drive the overall product? And like you said, it's, it's almost like a no-duh, like you better have it at this point because that's what your fans expect, right? Right, exactly. And so, um, um, uh, you know, it's a matter of time, and it's back to uh, what Jeff was saying about uh, distribution. We have to add more. We have to give more to the viewers. We have to have more places to find it. People expect it. Mm -hmm. And so we're finally at that point. It's taken a while and we're there. Cool. Joseph, um, you guys on the digital side have, I think, probably a unique uh, scenario compared to anybody else on this stage. Like you said, always trying to like get above a level uh, compared to other news organizations. Uh, tell us a little bit about what your guys' digital strategy is for Nesson.com. Yeah, it's actually, I think it's pretty unique in the sports world for broadcasters. So on the, on the, on the TV side a few years ago, um, we tried to do as big a deal as we could to add resources. I remember when uh, Pat Sullivan and Game Creek put together the truck that, that does Red Sox and Bruins. I don't know if it's still true, Pat, but it was, you know, this truck can do anything except for the Super Bowl. And we loaded it with lots of equipment and put positions in the truck to do interactive media and technology. And what we found is that with Silicon Valley developers, we can do things um, that work for the broadcast, but a lot of that wasn't translating online. So at the same time, we went down a very different path and created a, a separate vertical business for digital. Um, and so Nesson.com operates as its own entity. Um, it's the, the top regional sports website in the country. It's actually in the top 15 of all sports websites in the US. It doesn't matter if it's a newspaper or ESPN or whatever. It's in the top, top 15, roughly about 10 million uniques uh, a month. And so based on, on that success and creating really kind of a national brand, um, with Nesson.com, about three and a half, four months ago, we launched a second vertical, NessonFuel.com, which is its own vertical um, uh, business that supports uh, auto enthusiasts. You want to buy a car, you want to get into NASCAR, anything dealing with cars. We're even talking about if it has wheels, it should be on the site, so the Zamboni will be on there. Right. Um, and as of May, in its third month of life, it's now at 1.5 million uniques per month. So we're looking at digital very different. It's not an adjunct to the television broadcast arm. I think that's to the chagrin of some people on the broadcast side who say, wow, I want to get this on the web. Um, you know, there are instances where putting it on the web really won't help the web business. Um, the web business is a, is a national brand that's trying to, you know, trying to grow in the, in the vertical of, of competitive sports and then spin off brands like nestandfuel.com. Nest right. Ken, you kind of touched on it, so maybe you want to just follow up a little bit in terms of uh, the synergy that can be created between digital and maybe using some of that on linear. What's the backbone for Altitude in terms of kind of feeding the website? I know that that's kind of an initiative you guys want to uh, hopefully yeah, build we, upon uh, a little the, bit. If I'm being honest, the digital strategy is, uh, strategy is uh, non-existent right now. Right. Um, and, you know, when I walked in um, and looking at what everybody was doing at Altitude uh, digitally, um, uh, it was the team sites competing with the other team site, competing with our site, the Altitude TV. So it, it, there was no, there's, there's nobody. Um, uh, Driving the ship? Yeah. yeah. There. <laughs> so, uh, but it was made very apparent to me that the digital strategy moving forward, we, ha we have to be better. Um, 
we, uh, and there's a big push for it, not only to make it better, but to monetize. So you look at, um, you know, some of the things, and there's some very talented people on the, um, uh, uh, on the team sites too. So we have the draft show coming up, three and a half hours worth, and Nuggets have three first round picks, so um, on Thursday. And we're gonna be doing, you know, hopefully, uh, hoping for that second screen where you can watch unique content on the digital side, which talent moving in and out, you know, and pushing it, hey, I'm gonna have an interview over here um, in five minutes with uh, Coach Malone on the linear channel and being able to complement each other. So, uh, and you just look at the, what, um, uh, what can be done, I mean, um, to give shout out to, uh, nice job for the Root Sports folks with Rockies, I mean, they took, you know, on their website, they, um, they uh, started their uh, Tuesday, Takeover Tuesdays on uh, Twitter. So one of former player, whatever would, like Larry Walker or whatever, would take over the Twitter feed on Tuesdays. And when you, wa when you watch it, you know, and I, when I watched it for the first time, I'm going to grab my computer because I want to see the conversation. And what I understand is, you know, it went from, you know, 10,000 impressions on that Tuesday uh, to 150,000. So you just start thinking about, you know, in really producing content and how it can work together because I'm interested in the game, but now I'm opening my computer to see what, what, the, what the chat and what the conversation's going. It, you know, it forced me to do that. Right. And it's great. So, you know, I'm looking at uh, where, whether it's Facebook Live, whether, uh, whether it's Periscope, but, you know, why aren't we at Morning Skate for the Avalanche broadcasting a preview of tonight at Morning Skate on Facebook Live mm -hmm. and then tweeting out uh, those clips later to help support our broadcast that night. You know, there's just all these strategies that we're really wrapping your brain around um, all the things you can do. Great. You probably got to pick those players for Takeover Tuesday very carefully. I don't think you're going to see like Albert Bell do the Indians anytime soon or anything. Like uh, that. Baseball lends itself for uh, right. Takeover Tuesday, right, but right. for uh, hockey and uh, and well, well, we'll figure it out. Right. Th those would have to be a little bit more monitored. Yeah. Uh, Mark, we'll finish off with you, and and then uh, we'll, we'll get to our last topic, and then some questions from the crowd. Um, what's your guys' uh, digital uh, strategy moving forward? Well, I think I, I like the conversation. I think our industry is, is figuring it out. I think we need to change the lexicon a little. I think digital strategy is part of strategy. There's no such thing anymore. And I right. think yeah. social media is media, right? I think sort of those three legs of the stool are the things that our business is now. We, and we go to these conferences and everybody talks about how our kids consume media a certain way. And then we go, that's the digital media. And, and you do all the statistics and you listen to the, to, the, to the people that have the numbers and they talk about all that. And our kids tell us they don't care about linear as much anymore. And then we go back to our laboratories and create a bunch of TV for linear. So <laughs> I think that um, what we're finally realizing in the baseball thing is happily finally come to fruition because that, and, and, a, and a great model, right, by the way, baseball streaming took so long that it actually allowed us time to see that the baseball fans' median age was going up because the young people were not quite as engaged in that way. And, and happily, everybody and BAM and, and we have all worked together to get there. So. So I think the digital strategy is much more to what this group has said, which is now you have the resources to create content and you don't have to wait and hope that the good thing happens right as you go on the air at 10 o'clock. Right? We used to argue about we can't be in the news business unless, heaven forbid, you know, the good story we can break happens right as we turn the cameras on at 10 o'clock. And now I think we can be relevant to our fans and our consumers through those digital means um, you know, and use the resources we have for those fans because of the fact that we have the, the other outlets and the linear channel. Okay, cool. Um, one thing I wanted to get to, and I'll throw it out to all of you, Joseph brought it up, uh, and then we'll, we'll get to if anybody has any questions out there. Um, production and sales teams working together. Um, I, I think it's probably more important than ever, as Joseph was saying, in, in justifying some of this technology. And if you want some of these cool toys to play with, uh, there's, there better be a paycheck at the end of it, I'm sure. Um, I, I, any of you guys working on developing some synergy between those two teams? How do you make sure that production is aware of what sales needs, sales is aware of what production needs, and that at the end of the day, it doesn't overwhelm the telecast and feel like a NASCAR race or something like that, for that matter? I can give an example. We, we had a situation about eight months ago where NBC was using a product in one of the other regionals, I think at NBC Sports, called iPowwow. 
It's a social interaction tool that allows you to do real-time social engagement with the fans and shows the real-time voting live on the screen as you do it when you're asking questions. It's, it's all about engagement. But for us to engage in this tool, we needed sales to be able to step forward and commit to a sponsorship that was going to underwrite the cost of this and drive revenue. And that is the model that I think everybody here speaks to, and that's that you know, we want to engage and we want to do all these things, but it has to be done in a smart way and a way that drives revenue for, for the channel. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? I'm going to put my GM hat on, on here. Uh, one of the things I did uh, when I became uh, the GM of Fox Sports Arizona is we rebuilt the offices, and I put the GSM and the EP together uh, in adjoining offices. I put the sales staff with the producers, and I put everybody together because a couple of reasons. One, the whole combative attitude between sales and production had to go away because they work hand in hand. It actually worked. Um, you know, when the AEs can sit around and talk to the talent and uh, and the producers and get those little tidbits, you know, so and so did this or something happened with that or whatever, they take those out to clients and they can talk to clients and have insider information, you'd be amazed at what clients, how they respond to it. And then now all of a sudden you have engagement from different sponsors and they want to be a part of it because they see, feel like they're inside. And when they can hang out and, and bring the talent and bring people on a sales call and you know your host walks in or your play-by-play -play guy walks in, we even went as far as uh, with the Diamondbacks, Eric Burns went on a couple of calls for us. And when Eric Burns walked in and he was the starting center fielder for the Diamondbacks, you know, Sponsors are signing on the dotted line. Um, so the more you can get production integrated into the sales process, it's just you can do the things that you said with I powwow or fizzle on your end. And you guys are engaged, they're involved. And uh, you, know, you don't get that, oh, by the way, we sold this. It's the, it, the conversation happened before the pitch happened. And I think we're, we're kind of backwards. We still work backwards uh, in the sales process of television because you know, we are here to make money. And advertising revenue is still a big part of that. Sure. You know, um, uh, some people know that about a year and a half ago we did an experiment, and I would say it was sales, um, programming, production, and finance, right? So if you don't include finance, good luck. Um, and what we first did is we did a study to see is there anything we can do during a game, any game, uh, but we picked baseball, to raise the game rating. And the issue was that you have to do it for more than five minutes within a 15-minute window for Nielsen but then how many quarter hours do you have to do it? And it became impractical. The number was like 70 or 80 new things in a game, right? Would just would not be possible to, to do it. Uh, yeah, obviously, the way the team plays has a lot to do with it. So we worked with sales on, what if we experimented with things before and after a break, tried to do different things with commercial breaks to raise the, the rating or keep it up when we went to commercial. And, um, and so we started doing some really unique things. And from there has formed a, a great alliance between myself and the executive who runs sales and then um, the people reporting to me and who reporting to him. And so we're probably meeting three or four times a week with sales every week on common strategies and goals and letting um, our staffs work on the tactics. But it, a, a week doesn't go by that we don't have some s sort of strategic planning between programming, production, sales, and finance. Mm -hmm. Guys? And I think um, Mike hit it on the head as far as um, which sales doesn't do enough of is taking your talent, taking your executive producers, uh, taking your coordinating producers on the sales call. Um, that it, Over at uh, Root Sports and Fox Sports, um, I don't think I ever, we ever lost a sale. It, it always went through when you took your analyst because the, the guy wants to know, you know, uh, recent one at Root Sports, uh, his favorite team, or his favorite player was Nolan Ryan. Well, Jeff Hewson participated in two of his no-hitters. And that's all he wanted to talk about. We were rare, we didn't talk <laughs> much about the feature, but that's all he wanted to talk about. And two days later, he signed the deal. Um, your, your executive producers, your coordinating producers, they're gonna be passionate about, you know, I'll go, I'll go into a sales meeting. I, I love Supermo, we, we need, you know, it's an unbelievable tool for us. I'm, I'm speaking about the passion of the broadcast, not about, and, and the client is not threatened by I'm making the sale. I'm not, I'm talking about, so if they get, um, if they get excited about the product we're selling, um, they're more likely to buy it. And I just think, you know, we're, it's very underutilized, you know, taking Eric Burns, taking 
uh, you know, f for us, taking uh, Chris Marlowe, uh, um, to taking Scott Hastings, to uh, Peter McNabb on the, on the Avalanche side, to just, and they're willing to do it. And uh, I just think working with sales, then you feel like you're one group, you right. know, making that sale, and even your producers that go, and now you feel like, hey, we made this together. Right. Mark? From the GM perspective? No, I, I think they've said it well. It's a symbiotic relationship between production and sales. I think the reason we're a premium product and get premium revenues are two. Number one, the targeted audience, and as Jeff said, you have to be there for that event live. And the other is we can integrate the, the sales elements into the, into the content itself. And uh, I think the audience uh, understands and accepts that now as long as we do it well. Sure. Any questions out there? I know. It's early. Everyone's probably hung over from the reception last night. Um, I have one more that, uh, that Jeff touched on, and just raise your hand if anybody does want to bring anything up to these guys. Um, dealing with a losing team, it, it, it's not easy. You're not going to uh, win the title every year, um, and I know multiple of you uh, brought this up uh, in our, our, our panel prep. Uh, how do you sustain ratings? How do you sustain engagement? How do you still make fans care? Of course, there's that tribal aspect, but it's tougher. Um, you know, when the, the Lakers have three losing seasons in a row after winning so much, you know, the, the fans get spoiled. Um, what are some uh, strategies that you guys have used in terms of still making it interesting, still making people tune in, despite the fact that, that we're looking at a below 500 team? What are you going to do, Kevin? <laughs> <laughs> I, got, I got two of them. Right? <laughs> Just roll Sackick and Forsberg out on the ice every night, right? Um, well, that, uh, honestly, um, it's funny you should say that because we, on the... Um, you know, uh, a lot of the stuff um, and promos are all about Sackick, Forsberg. <laughs> it's all the past. Right. And, you know, r right. So I, uh, I'm like, we got to, our teams do not have an identity. They're all about Sackick, Wah, all this. You, you need to, it goes back to what the, you know, the backstage Lakers type show. You know, you f you you see these players, and not just not just that, but you, not, it wasn't only Kobe Bryant; it was these other guys you fell in love with. You know, and so you want to watch the game because you care about those, and that and that that's the simplest strategy. When your teams, you know, celebrate a player, celebrate uh, the NBA, the NHL, celebrate you know, make them want to watch because they love those players. Yeah, there's a, another challenge there, too, because you have owners or GMs, and if your announcers say one negative thing, they're jumping all over you, right? And it's hard not to. And so, you know, the goal is to sell hope. And so you have to sell hope. And that's all you have sometimes. You know, some of these teams, you just don't have, the Lakers have no hope, right? I mean, the last three years. <laughs> but you're selling hope. That's what backstage is. You're selling stories. You're selling association. And honestly, they do a great job, and I'm not ripping Time Warner at all, Charter. Um, the backstage show, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the social media show that you had, which was fantastic, I loved it. They're selling hope all the time, and you have to sell hope. You have to give people hope, reason to watch, give, build association with your players. As, as somebody who grew up in the Chicago area, there's hope in the word of, I grew up a Cubs fan. <laughs> um, and so when I was in uh, Minnesota with Fox Sports North, they were building Target Field, and I said to the... Um, uh, president of the team, Dave St. Peter, how much do you want this to be a ballpark where we show you a Wrigley Field kind of experience? And he said, Joseph, in the next 50 years, we're going to have some really bad teams, <laughs> right? Right. We got to figure that out. And so I think that that the hope part is is really key. Something we did differently this year that I think we're going to start to repeat year round now, because we started off with a team that, um, frankly, was doing better than we had thought after a, a couple of horrible. Uh, finishes before that, and potentially even championship fatigue in the city. Right. Um, so, uh, credit to our, our CEO, Sean McGrail, about five, six weeks into the season, he challenged us with come up with a different way to present the team because the team's actually winning in ways that we'd like to talk about. And so, we got together the same core group of people that do, like m probably most regions, a preseason meeting where you talk about what you're going to do with the NHL or the NBA or the MLB broadcast. And instead, we brought them all back, game analysts on their day off, you name it, um, sat them in the room for two hours and said, what's this team doing differently? And we listened to the guys who played baseball, Dennis Eckersley and, 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 and the like, and heard from them, here's what the team's doing differently that as a player we notice 
And then from that day forward, we started to message, not based on what we planned a month before the season, but based on what you were seeing on the field at that time. And we really did see kind of a, a pickup of those lines on talk radio and social and other places where it was kind of strange, but all of a sudden there's a new message coming out. It's not a team marketing message. It's what the analysts see going on in the field. Even on a day that they're not playing as well, they're all in lockstep. And so we decided we're going to roll that out about six weeks into every season, whether it's you know, cool. baseball or hockey, as kind of a best practice to, to you know, as he said, sell hope. Now, I think it, here's the good news. I, I think it's very rare for a fan of a team, and it's almost unheard of for an alum of a university to change their allegiance. Right? Fans are fans, and they're savvy, and they get it, but they're not... How many people go, I used to be a fan of the Lakers, but now I'm not. I'm fan. You know, that doesn't happen. That means right? they so weren't a fan of either of them. Indeed, right. <laughs> absolutely. So I think, you know, to Mike's point, it actually uh, dawns on me, you know, not only do we focus on, somebody once said, you know, nobody cares about what Steve Nash ate for breakfast. And I'm thinking that's exactly the opposite. People would love to know what Steve Nash eats for breakfast. So the backstage thing is part of that. The other part, uh, to Mike's point, is we have a show that is entirely focused on the fan. And I think as the Lakers develop new hope, second pick in the draft, four young players that are hopefully NBA caliber players, in that, in that interim period, we're going to actually spend more time listening to and speaking to the fans themselves. So we do a half hour every day on, you know, it's called Hashtag uh, Lake Show, and it's actually a show that speaks to and hears from the fans. So I think that's part of what you do to try to keep that connection, and we can do it more directly now. Sure. Phil, I'll let you finish it out. I think they've all spoken to it eloquently. I mean, hope is a big deal. We went through it with the Cubs. They've been an unbelievable a, a partner. Yeah. <laughs> and then in 2010, um, we were fortunate enough to get Theo Epstein as our general manager, um, except he was a little too frank. He, he went in front of the microphone and basically said, I'm going to get rid of everybody, and we're going to be bad for three or four years, but we're going to build the minor league system, and we're going to be good down the road, just wait and see. And we're all at the TV station, oh, God, don't tell them <laughs> you're going to be bad for three years. Just, get, you know, circle around that a little bit. But... Um, we all embraced sort of that message because that was the message the team was delivering and it was all about hope. And, you know, it's not to say that the ratings didn't go down when the team was bad, but I think, you know, fans are fans and they're still passionate about their team and we've seen that come around very quickly as the team has started to improve. Great. We're going to finish it out. I warned all of you, so don't pretend like you, you weren't warned. Um, in the next five years, in the RSN market, you had to pick one trend, one crazy thing that's going to come out of left field. We can, it can be a technology. It can be a, a production strategy. It can be a, a sales strategy. It can be a, a, a rights thing, even if you want, though I doubt any of you will pick on rights up here. Um, what would that one thing be in the next five years when we are having this summit in five years? Um, and, and everyone is going to be talking about uh, Phil. Sorry. <laughs> we can go to Mike first if you want a sec. I, I've really been impressed with the limited amount I've seen of virtual reality, and I'm not saying that it's necessarily going to replace and be the live television experience that you're going to watch the game in, but as you go to Universal theme parks and you go to these other places where they're really unleashing... Um, virtual that is so compelling and so engaging, I think when that technology um, becomes readily available, I think that's going to be something that sports fans are really going to embrace. This notion that you could watch Game 7 of the NBA Finals live on television on Sunday and then have a virtual experience offered to you afterwards where you're literally sitting with your best friend and you're sitting courtside, center court, and re-engaging that experience. I think those kinds of things with virtual are going to be very thing. unique to our business. It's cool stuff. Mike, quick hit. Uh, with that, it's going to be more interactive. I think you're going to see more interactive television. You're going to see more streaming, more places to stream, which is going to make our business tougher. Um, but companies like DraftKings, they're going to they're going to start rising again. As you saw, they're now uh, got a deal with the state of New York, and I think it's going to come back. We're going to have more interactive and kind of so-called. We won't call it gambling because if you bring it up at DraftKings, they'll lose their mind. But there's <laughs> going to be some sort of wagering on it as well. Joseph, quick one. Yeah, there's been a crazy year, right? Layoffs, buyouts, lots of stuff going on. Um, so we've got to look pretty heavily at the business side. And I think there is every reason to believe that whether it's Nielsen, Rentrack, or somebody, they're going to start measuring all the places that we do TV that don't get picked up, bars, restaurants, here, here. Right? right? So in five years, I think somebody will have that solution because we'll, we'll pay to get those numbers to sell. Ken? Oh, well, when, you, when you're thinking about an IP address, just how we used to think about a channel. 
uh, we're going to be producing uh, all our content for everything, including virtual reality. I just, the, the production departments are gonna be looking at producing all that content for everything and, go, and actually re going out and reaching out, sending our content to those eyeballs. Mark, finish it off. I agree with all four of my colleagues. I would say it's fundamental. When you take a $60,000 production and now you can do it for 15000 and it looks better or the same, you can do 4X the content, and that's what we're going to need for the new distribution means. Great, guys. Well, thank you so much to the panelists. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stage.